we we'll me let's sing this old song, number 338. 338 in your hymnal. Let's sing the first, second, last stanzas. One, two, and four. 338. I have a message from the Lord. tonight. I hope you got out on this beautiful day. Lemonade in a hammock, right? Everybody? Good nap in a hammock? Probably not. Good to see you tonight, though, and let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful day that you've given us. I thank you also for the services that we were able to enjoy this morning. We pray that you bless those t this tonight as well, and we ask that you'd be with us as we take praises in just a moment, and that you'd bring to mind some of the things that you've done for us this week. Uh, so that we can praise you for them. And we also ask that you be with us as we study your word. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, probably the big one is the Resurrection Sunday, two weeks from today. Amen. And so don't forget that one. That one's coming pretty close. And um, if you get a chance, invite someone. Uh, be praying about that, that the Lord will give you an opportunity to an extend a special invitation and maybe they don't even know that it's Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday and you can remind them and say hey are you going anywhere and a good place to be on that Sunday is church and so just get that foot in the door there with a special Sunday and if you're able to be here as well we do have a couple of things going on tonight and also this week uh, we're gonna take praises in just a moment we do that right before the message and Miss Connie Ritchie is going to give us an update for uh, the ministry that they're doing there in Africa. She's one of our missionaries, and uh, she's back here in the area taking care of some personal business. And so we get to benefit from uh, having her here, at least for today, I'm guessing, over the course of the next couple of weeks, which is great. And so she's going to give us a brief update on just some of the things going on there in Africa. Um, myself and a few men from the church are going to head down to Bearing Precious Seed and Fellowship Track League tomorrow and pick up some tracks. And then Brother Keith's going to be preaching on Wednesday. I think I mentioned that this past Wednesday. Uh, but I'm not going to be here. We're going to take a quick trip down to Georgia and drop off the literature that we're picking up tomorrow. And so be in prayer for our family. We'll be back on Saturday for the work day. But Brother Keith's going to be uh, preaching on Wednesday. Now, the thing is that all, sometimes when the pastor's out of town, people don't come to church. Don't let that happen. And so come enjoy Brother Keith. I wish I was going to be here to hear uh, what the Lord has laid on Brother Keith's heart. Uh, but do come and still be faithful to attending church on Wednesday. College and career have a luncheon on the 16th and the Lord's Supper also the 16th. And then our final gym night is on the 22nd. Uh, speaking of gym night, uh, we had a good meeting yesterday morning at 830 I had a good, peop a good number of people show up just to have conversation about what's going on with the, the gymnasium, and so we enjoyed that. Uh, we'll have at least one more deacons meeting as we uh, pull some things together, and then we'll present something to the church to vote on here 
as soon as possible, and Lord willing, we can move forward with that project one way or another, and I look forward to seeing how the Lord directs there. I mentioned this morning that at the conclusion of our service, I will be recommending two um, investments that we make as it relates to our missions giving, and I mentioned those to you on Wednesday, and so we'll conclude the service tonight um, with making those recommendations and then voting on that one. So there's some of the things going on, and I look forward to worshiping with you and hearing praises in just a moment, but go ahead and grab your hymnal as Brother Tim comes back and leads us in our next hymn. Thank you, Pastor. Remain seated, turn number 331. Number 331. Let's sing the first, second, last stanzas. Ushers, you get ready to come on the fourth. 331. I should have talked to Chelsea before. Oh, we'll hold on those of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. And there's another place we'll hold like that too. My bad, I should have communicated. Let's start from the beginning again. Here we go in the beginning. Tell me the old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. There we go. Of Jesus. Ushers have come forward to take her evening tithes and offerings. Noah, would you mind praying for us, sir? Uh, Lord, thank you for this evening. Please take, bless this offering and use it for your glory. And uh, help us apply your word to our hearts tonight. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Thank you, ladies, very much. This time, the Shopper Pease family is going to come sing for us. Thank you very much. 1 Timothy chapter 4 is where we'll be at tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, but before we get there, we're going to take praises. I believe Elin has the microphone tonight. And she came up last Sunday in my office. She said, Pastor, can I get the microphone next Sunday night? And so a lady that plans in advance. And I appreciate her hel hel helping out tonight. We're going to start on this side. If you have a praise tonight, we'll start over here, and then we'll work our way over to this side of the auditorium. Anybody on this side have a praise they'd like to mention tonight? Anybody at all before we hand it over? Okay, Brother Dave up front. Well, I'd like to thank the Lord for my salvation. Uh, uh, it's amazing how you can go to the Lord and get peace and comfort from it. And the blessing this week was just what we just seen, the family up there singing together, serving the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. Anybody else? All right, Brother Gary. I want to thank the Lord for a beautiful little grandson we got this week. He looks just like me. All right. <laughs> All, all wrinkled and not much hair. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be better if I just move on. <clears throat> Congratulations, Brother Gary. Miss Candy. All right. <laughs> all right. I see your hand up in the back there. birthday is tomorrow. Your birthday is tomorrow. Congratulations. So we can sing to, to you as well. Y'all need to help me remember we can't leave tonight without singing to Brother Shoemaker. And now we have a second. Anybody else on this side? Brother Scott over there. I'm just thankful we have the opportunity to take our burdens to the Lord. Um, 
the Wolf family put an update to their little girl that we've been praying for that we just went and uh, met a couple weeks ago, but the Lord just put them on my heart with what they've been going through, and uh, we asked you guys to pray on Wednesday. Uh, she had another brain, brain bleed, and we were praying that that would stop. So far, she showed really good progress and had a really stable days since then. They expect another neurological check in the next day or two, and so still praying that it has stopped. Um, but she was able to touch her nose and eyes and stuff with her dad's, holding her dad's hand. Uh, so she's shown some progress. So praying uh, that the Lord will bring her through. But just really grateful that even though it's not me going through it, I don't really know this family, but just uh, knowing that as a Christian, we can take our, our burdens to the Lord and know that uh, we can rest in him. Amen. Anybody else on this side has something you'd like to share? All right, we'll go over to this side. Presley had her hand up first. And then Brother Don, I think, had his hand up second. Um, I'm a single for Miss Candy and Miss Tammy. <laughs> Miss Candy and Miss Tammy, is that what it was? All right. Sunday school class teachers or? Yes. All right. Just make sure I got that correctly. Brother Don. I just thank the Lord how uh, I had a... For me, it was a really good blessing yesterday, um, and it just kind of made, made me think of how the Lord, we never know what he's doing. It was probably 10 years ago, I don't, I'm not really sure, but it was quite a while ago that uh, I had some uh, family pass away, and they asked me to clean out their house, and so I did, and, and I've had some of that stuff. Uh, in my house ever since and I just knew that somehow I had to get rid of it and the Lord provided a way and just in doing so gave me a blessing yesterday so it had been all these years that God just had that blessing just waiting for me anybody else on this side has something like to share all right Mrs. Turner I just thank the Lord for his blessings that he does abundantly above. I was going through some file uh, things, cleaning out stuff, and I found an envelope with some money that had been in there since last August. <laughs> <laughs> Most people have the problem of finding bills that have been there since last. That truly was a blessing. Anybody else on this side have something they'd like to share? All right, Miss Vicki. Um, we had a wonderful trip up to Canada, got to see uh, Corey and Eli and their family, and um, I don't know if you remember Christina injuring her leg three or four weeks ago, and she found out she's got a torn meniscus and a torn ACL, but um, she, it seems like she's making great progress with that. She's able to walk around without crutches or anything, so I just thank the Lord for answering prayers with that, and thank you for praying for her. Anybody else on this side? or tonight in the auditorium. All right, Elin, if you'll take that to Miss Connie, and I'm going to mention a praise while she's taking it over there. Um, I, I was trying, I was sitting here while the Chompers were singing and the Pieces were singing, trying to figure out how to word this, and uh, the best way I could come up with is that I'm thankful for the, the conclusion that God gives to life. Uh, you know, we have day and night cycles. That's pretty big. Can you imagine how life would be if we just didn't sleep, and it was just a constant go, 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 go. Uh, I'm thankful that there's an end to every day. You know, sometimes if you work all night, it's an end to every other day, but there's, there's a cycle to it, and there's a cycle to a week, and there's a, a cycle to a year, and there's a cycle to the seasons. And uh, I think that's pretty neat. There's a definite conclusion to things, even on things that are negative, that are, from our perspective, hard to deal with. There's an end to them. They don't go on forever, and um, I'm thankful for that. Uh, the good things— Th those don't go on forever typically either, unless they're related to God. Uh, but just the, the cycle of things that, you know what, there, there's a time to stop. And there's a refreshing and a newness to life. I'm thankful for that. Well, it's our privilege uh, to have uh, Miss Connie Ritchie with us. And she's going to share at this time uh, some of the things that um, is going on in, in Africa. And so she's here with us, and I'm going to give her an opportunity to do that at this time. I have a blessing. One of my... One of the biggest blessings I get is when I come back and I see faces that are still here. That is a huge blessing to me, those who are faithful. 
Um, <laughs> I wasn't planning to cry. Um, Andy is in the process of getting dual citizenship. Once he gets it, then I can get it. Um, and once he does that, then we don't have to every three years renew our visas. <laughs> so that will be a huge blessing. Um, in Kenya, there's a lot of corruption, but they've, they've moved a lot of the, their government things to be more digital, so there's less corruption. Um, we have some friends who have been trying for citizenship for over 20 years. And Andy is to the final stage. Um, well, all he has left is to do an interview with the government official. And he ha if you know Andy, he doesn't know how to sing, but he, they, he has to sing the Kenyan National Anthem in Swahili. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be interesting. But once he has that interview and sings the song, um, then he just has to pay $2,000, and then he'll be a citizen. So. And then for me, then it'll be another $20. So <laughs> it's, I'm cheap. <laughs> um, but uh, we've had a lot of encouraging things happening um, recently. Our church is located, um, the distance would be about one exit down on the highway um, from a, one of the top colleges, universities in Kenya. And um, so we have a great opportunity there. We can't go there ourselves, but we do have a young man I'll tell you about in a second. Um, who is a student there and so he's been bringing lots of his friends and um, they're all very intelligent um, in in Kenya you have to when you do your final tests in high school they post your grades for the whole country to, to see and you have to have certain grades to get to certain colleges and this is one of the top ones and so everyone there is very very smart and um, let me back up just a little bit. Um, we work with missionary Peter Morris, and, and he does um, like pastors' conferences once a week, or once a month for a week. Um, he brings pastors from the bush into the city. He houses them and feeds them and trains them. And in those trainings, um, Andy teaches some of the classes and some of our other fellow missionaries teach some of the classes. So they all work together. But um, one of the pastors that had come for the initial one in the city, um, his son attends that college. And so in the evenings, his son would come be with his dad and attend our church. So that way, he ended up connected to our church. He is now Andy's assistant pastor. And um, he, he has brought several of his fellow classmates, who and they're all graduating, or they've just graduated, and they all continue to come and um, there's about six or seven of them um, that Andy's really trying to mentor. And he's training them. He's, he's like, he'll give them a scripture and say, I want you to teach us on this on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we just sit around a table, and there's six or eight of us. And um, so he, he was trying to teach them how to teach as well as get them to get grounded in the word. And... Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the guy that he gave it to, he says, okay, we're going to go through this passage one verse at a time. I'm going to read a verse, and then we'll each say what we got from that verse, and then we'll go to the next verse, and you read it and continue on. There was like 12, 11 or 12 verses. We got through three <laughs> because the, the depth of wisdom and understanding that these young men have and only one of them's ever been to church, and that's the assistant pastor. Um, so they're, they're, so, they're like sponges. They, they want to just learn all they can, and everything Andy teaches them, they're like, oh, give me more, give me more, give me more. Um, so that's been a real encouragement, especially for Andy. Um, and then last July, um, I teach the Sunday school classes, and... Um, Last July, one of my girls who's been coming since we started the church, um, she came early. And so I asked her, I said, do you know if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Because I do it through the lessons, and when, they, when I lead in prayer, they all pray. So you don't know if they are doing it for real or not. Um, but she said no. And so I started going through the plan of salvation with her. Well, then our twins came, and um, they, I asked them the same thing. So I, I won all three of them to the Lord. 
So I told them I wanted to start coming on Saturdays for discipleship. And so just the three of them came the first week. Well, when the other kids saw that they were coming on Saturdays, they wanted to come. Well, you can't come unless you're saved. <laughs> so each, each week we'd have a few more, and so I'd have to witness to a few more. <laughs> It was such a chore, but, <laughs> but um, and then they, some of them would say, my friend wants to know how to be saved, and they would bring them to me, and I mean, just, just in a short period of time, there was like 19 of them, and they're all around the age of 10, 11 years old, and um, they've been doing the discipleship lessons and growing, and it's just been a huge blessing, um, so right. thank you. Thank you very much. Now, she is happy to answer any questions you may have. And I did have one. Can you videotape Brother Richie singing the national anthem <laughs> so that we could add that to our permanent archives? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if you're there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, go ahead and, and look down to verse 8. And we're going to stand and read verse 8 down to verse 12. So if you have it there, go ahead and stand. And this will be our scripture reading for tonight. All right, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in truth, in purity. And let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us this week. I thank you for the opportunity that you give us daily to see your hand at work in our lives. And I know that we're often very busy and sometimes forget to thank you for what you've done. And so we acknowledge that tonight and ask that you would help us get better at that uh, so that we can be encouraged and aware of the bountiful things that you do for us. I do thank you for uh, Miss Connie being here and for the opportunity that we have to, to visit with her. And I pray that you would uh, bless her as she's trying to work out uh, some of the responsibilities that she has here in Xenia. And I uh, pray that you would be with us this week as we seek to serve you. And Father, we ask that you'd work in our hearts this evening with your word and that you convict us individually of any adjustments that we might need to make in order to be able to serve you better this week. And we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for your preservation. And we thank you for the fellowship that we've been able to enjoy today. And again, we ask that you bless the service. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. I'll probably only have a chance for one or two of you to answer this or maybe three or four, depending on how quick you go. But I look out over the auditorium tonight, and I see a lot of different professions, and I assume there are a lot of different hobbies that would be represented. And so I want to know what your favorite tool is, and we use that in a very broad sense of the word. So maybe it's a tool that you use in a hobby, or maybe it's an actual tool that you uh, use in your profession. But I have a favorite one I'm going to mention. I'll give you an opportunity. Do you have a favorite tool? Or something that you like using? Brother Smith. A good pair of running shoes. All right, they'll take that one. Good tool, Miss Laura. Paintbrush. All right, that's a good tool, Brother Keith. Table saw. You have to be careful with that one, but that can be a good one. Catherine. A pencil. Okay, Brother Joel. A Glock 19. <laughs> Aren't you a repairman? <laughs> okay. I just wasn't sure which vein you were going with that. Javi, okay. The repair man, dear. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on there. Yes, ma'am. Sewing machine, all right. Compound bow, hobby. Hobby, okay. Mine, jo Josh, did you have one? Scroll saw, all right. Profession and hobby for that one. My favorite tool is my multimeter. May, some of you may know what that one is, but I prize that one very much because it tells me a lot of different things. One of the things that it tells me is how bad what I'm about to touch is going to hurt me. <laughs> tells me how much voltage is there and tells me how much it's going to hurt if I touch it without turning it off. But I can test, I can do work in a house with that. I can test switches. I can test wires. I can test things in my car. I like my multimeter. If I were to lose that one, 
I wouldn't be losing my right arm, but maybe my pointer finger on my right hand or something like that one. I like that tool. I have a lot of tools, but that one I think is my favorite one. And the reason why I, I think that's probably my favorite one is because it helps me out in so many different ways. I'm a pretty practical guy. I like things that, that make practical sense. And so the tools that I value are the ones that help me do things that I need to do. Otherwise, they're just taking up space. We might as well get rid of them unless it's just a cool tool. Some of those are fun to hang on to. So I want to ask you this question. We're going to tie it in here. What are some of the tools that God gives you as you are a witness for him? That's a good question, isn't it? If the goal is to be a witness for Christ and to be a testimony for Jesus Christ to our world, what are some of the tools that God gives us? We're going to look at six tonight, and this is a familiar text, but one that's helpful to stop and to visit from time to time. First Timothy is a pastoral epistle written to Timothy. And if you look in chapter 1, verse 3, he's leaving him at Ephesus, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Chapter 3 is one that you're familiar with. Verse 2 begins the qualifications of a bishop. And then if you look down in verse 12, that begins the qualifications for a deacon. And so, again, this is one of the pastoral epistles. And as we transition to chapter 4, specifically in the text that we're in, he says that he should, Timothy should be an example of the believer. And then he mentions six specific tools that he has at his disposal to help him be a model believer. Or we could word it this way, to model a believer in front of other people. What tools that I have at my disposal to be a witness for Christ? Or we could say, what, what tools do I have at my disposal, do you have at your disposal as a Christian to help others see what a Christian is or what it means to be Christ-like? Those are things I can focus on. Those are things that I can utilize. You know, I have a, a, some tools I go into a hardware store and I can look at, and they're getting fewer and fewer these days, but some of them I look at, or a garage sale or antique store, I say, what is that tool used for? Or I have a job and say, you know what, there's got to be a tool for that. I love those moments because then I can go up and I can say, honey, there's a job that I need to do and there's a tool for that job. And I was talking with someone this week. They said, you know, I, I just need some things to do so I can tell my wife I need a tool for that job. I said, no, 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 you got to word it different. There's a specific way to word that. You say, this is a job that we need done. It's going to cost us this much money to do it. If we hire someone, I can buy this tool for less. I need this tool, and it will be to the benefit of our family if I have this tool. Huh? 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 Yeah. You can give me money later for the wise advice that I'm giving you that's just extra. Actually, that was free because I love you so much. But it helps us accomplish things. If I don't know what the task is, then I don't know what tool I need. If I don't know what the tool does, then it doesn't help with the task, does it? I can have all kinds of tools, and if I don't know how to use them, then they're not very profitable. But in verse 12, again, it says, Be thou an example of the believers. And he gives six specific things that we have at our disposal. And he encourages Timothy to use them. First of all, in word, in the things that you say. That's one of the tools that God gives you to be a witness for Christ and an encouragement to fellow believers. Now, we could share the gospel. That would be a way of using words. But there's a testimony that goes along, and we're going to pull from the definition of that word example or a, a model believer. There's a, a way a believer should talk. Now, I struggle with this one a little bit. I have to find a good balance because my love language is to be difficult with people. That's how I express my love and appreciation to people is by giving them a hard time. And so I have to balance that because at some point, if I go too far, I just discourage people. And that doesn't go well if a pastor is going around discouraging people. But words can be encouraging. Words can be dependable. And so let me mention some of those. And Matthew 5.37 is one of those, dependable. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. I need to have dependable words. When I, as a Christian, have a dependable words, words that people can count on, they have a tendency to listen to what we, need, we have to say. And as it relates to being a Christian, we have, we're willing, if we're doing our job correctly, we have one or two things to say that are important. If I've lied about every other area of life, and then I come to someone with the gospel, you think they're going to believe me. They're going to question my integrity. Uh, they're going to wonder, well, you know, what in the world is wrong with you? You think I'm really going to listen. 
And so one of the ways that I can model Christianity in front of someone and I can be an example of a believer is by having dependable words. When I say yes, it's yes. When I say no, it's no. And the way that I compensate for that is I'm careful when I say yes or no. When you commit to something, you know, we're not perfect, but when we commit to something, our word, word needs to be dependable. And that's one of the things that the Bible says that, or one of the ways that we can use words. Uh, we could use words, and we need to use words in a, a good way. Ephesians 4.29, so how do we use our words? They're dependable words. They're good words. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The idea of, of edifying, again, is building up. And sometimes it's easier to tear, tear people down than it is to be, build them up. And again, that's uh, one thing that I have to balance, okay? I'm, there's joking, but if I'm not careful, I joke all the time. And if I'm always joking in a negative fashion, then eventually I'm going to start tearing people down. They may still smile. They may still laugh at my jokes out of obligation because they don't want to hurt me. Uh, but at some point, they're going to be asking the question, boy, d does he really think I'm ignorant? D does he really think that about me? And so we end up tearing people down. And you know what? If we're not careful, if, if we're going through a hard time in life, sometimes we just start talking negatively, don't we? Bad day, things that are bothering us, we vent with other people. The Bible says when we communicate, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace and typically in scripture grace has the idea of favor unto the hearers in other words one of the ways that i can use my words as a tool to be a witness for jesus christ and a blessing to other christians is to be encouraging with the words that come out of my mouth sometimes that's hard uh, sometimes we're geared different ways, but that's one of the ways that we can use the words that God gives us, our mouth. We can build people up with it. Number three, we can have gracious words. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may, or that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. The idea of grace lends itself to giving joy or pleasure, delight sweetness or uh, loveliness uh, you know we could ask ourselves the question would someone say that when you open your mouth it's full of words of joy or your speech is, is lovely that's kind of a funny word for a guy to use but it's a good word is it encouraging is it one that brings sweet is it sweetness is it does the same thing does it do the same thing for conversation that salt does for mcdonald's french fries you know, where it just gives it that, that spice and that, uh, that joy to be around. We have the opportunity to use it that way, don't we? And sometimes, we, again, we, we bicker and we're upset at this or we're upset with that. And we have to be careful because of our words. Our words can be tools to use in an appropriate way. Now, I have a, a tendency sometimes to abuse tools. No one else does that, right? I was out working on my truck, not my current truck, years and years ago. I was working on my truck, and I think I was working on the, the suspension, and so a different part of it, and I had a wrench, and I needed a hammer. And you know what I did with that wrench? I used it as a hammer. I'm just beating on whatever it was all the day long with that wrench, and some, an older guy walked up to me, and he said, you know, they make a tool for that. <laughs> it's called a hammer. Same thing with screwdrivers. Uh, there was a day in my life that every one of my flathead screwdrivers were bent over because I used it to pry on something. That's not what that's for. Th you're really going to hate me for this, but my wife bought me a really nice knife one time. She had to buy me a second knife just like it because of what I did to the first knife. I had it out, and I was using it as a pry tool. Oh, I, I know. I'm not going to tell you what brand of knife it was because you, you might throw me out. But I was up, and I was prying something. I looked at it, and I said, it's aluminum. It'll give pretty easy. I just need to bend it a little bit. So I opened up my knife. I stuck the tip under it. I pried, and you know what happened? Ting! And I pulled my knife back out, and I said, that looks very sad. <laughs> Why? Because I, I misused the tool. What would have been good for a specific purpose ended up being a waste. And that's what God has with our words. Again, it says in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth. And uh, Timothy was a, a younger man, but this applies to us as well. But be thou an example of the believers in word. 
It says also in your conversation, and that would be your conduct, the things that you do. And uh, what is it that our conversation should have? Well, uh, we could list a number of things. I'm just going to mention a couple here tonight. One, our conversation should be one of integrity. And we're going to go to Proverbs 20, verse 7 on this. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Uh, the integrity has a special reference to uprightness or um, being honest in what you do in your dealings with other people. You know, in our world today, sometimes finances get pretty tight uh, with all this inflation that comes from who knows where, right? And uh, with grocery expenses going up and gas going on, everything getting expensive, everybody's looking out for uh, conserving money and how can I make this money go by as best I can. And you know what? Sometimes it's a temptation to, well, I can take advantage of this situation just a little bit and be dishonest with this person and they'll never know. Um, that's one of the characteristics of someone who's not saved. It should not be a characteristic of someone who is saved. Again, our conduct can be one of integrity. This was a great one. Our conduct should be without covetousness. Hebrews thirteen five. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight, but it seems like in our world today that we're struggling with the idea of being content. We look around and, you know, there's TV and there's Internet and there's YouTube. And you know what? There are some people that have some pretty cool things. And you can just sit down on your phone or your TV or your computer and you can watch all kinds of different things. Now, if this describes you, I'm not trying to point you out. I'm just making an illustration. Again, I was talking, talking about this with someone the other day. You know, um, in days gone by, you didn't normally have an air-conditioned garage to work on your car in with a, a lift to lift it up where it was, everything was sealed and nice and painted and finished and all your tools were polished. But you know what? Thanks to YouTube, I can pull up in my phone and I can watch a guy work in a really nice shop with all his wall of tools just spick and span and there's no dirt it's all climate controlled and you know it's a it's a set really is what it is and so you know what i get to thinking whoa that guy has a really nice shop to work in everybody must have a shop to work in just like that except for me you know what i need a really nice shop like that to work in because that guy has a shop you know what that is a lack of contentment you know what people usually did in days gone by you know what we did growing up Pull out in the yard, hope it doesn't fall on you, and get done what you need to do, and, and you get back on the road. You know, work on it wherever you need to be done. But you know what? All across the board, we have a tendency to have a high expectation of what is rightfully ours. We're not content. And it's so easy to look around us and to see how God has blessed this person or that person and say, well, I don't have that. Oh, I don't have that. But the Bible tells me, though, that as it relates to my conduct, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know one of the things that's really nice? To be able to look at someone and say, I am so glad that you have that. I don't have it, but you know what? I am happy for you, and I'm just fine the way that I am. And you know what? Sometimes God gives me something that he didn't give someone else. And I'm thankful for that, and we can trade back and forth, and God be the glory. God's given different people different things so that we can be a blessing to each other. That's great, isn't it? And it's a lot more than I deserve. But he's taking care of me. And you know what? We live in a very blessed society. One of the things sometimes that we struggle with is just simply being content with what we have because God's taking care of us and giving us everything that we need and so much more than that. And so, again, uh, without covetousness, uh, number three, our conversation should be with one of integrity, one without covetousness. And this is an interesting phrase, one that is becoming of the gospel. It's from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, And let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. It's the idea of something that's suitable or worthy of the gospel. In keeping with the gospel or uh, not going against the gospel. In other words, I should live and my conduct should be as such that fits the gospel, fits someone who is saved. Kind of along the lines of Ephesians 4, 22 and tw through 24 that has the idea of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. That ye may put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I should be living in a way that's conducive to the gospel, that's becoming the gospel. And those are just some of the ways that I can use my conduct, or that you can use your conduct to be a witness to other people, to be an encouragement to fellow believers. But each of those are tools that God gives us to reach a world. There are things that God gives me to, to do something with, to, to share the gospel, to have an influence, a, a positive impact on somebody. The next one in our verse, in verse 12, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, and here's a good one, in charity. What's the other word for charity? What do we know it better by? Love. Boy, there's an interesting definition. We have the world's definition of love. But the Bible's definition of, the love is, of love is more of the idea of promoting someone else's interest. In other words, my actions and the things that I do are in promotion of someone else other than myself. That's the idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. At least one of those components of that is I'm looking out for somebody else. Mo uh, the most. A lot of the people in our world today look out for number one. Sometimes I'm guilty of looking out for number one. Do you know what's really nice to run across in our world today? Someone who's looking out for someone other than themselves. Isn't that a blessing? Praise God, sometimes someone's looking out for me. My wife does that for me a lot. She looks out for me, and I'm very thankful for my wife because she loves me. Now, hopefully I'm a blessing to her as well because uh, I hope I look out for her like she looks out for me. But God puts people in our lives to look out for each other. One of the earmarks of Christianity is that we live our lives in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says, Let all your things be done with charity. You know, I can criticize someone in love and it'd be okay. I can criticize someone in malice or being rude or despiteful and it's a completely different situation. You know, if someone's looking out for my best interest and is telling me something I'm doing wrong— and as long as I'm in the right mindset, then, you know, that's a good thing. I, I can take that. I want someone to help me out in that way. But I tell you what, if someone's just wanting a way to vent and to put other people down, I struggle with that one. One of the earmarks of Christianity, one of the tools that God gives us, is to be able to uh, communicate things and to live life in love. Again, the Bible says in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in, in word, in conversation, in charity or love, and then it says spirit, in spirit. We're going to park on this one for just a moment, not too long because we're about out of time, but it has to do with your, your disposition, your passions. Are you meek? Are you mild? Or are you forgiving? Are you easy to offend? Or, or what are you like? Who are you as it relates to your, your disposition? And we should be different as Christians as it relates to our spirit or, or who we are, how we act. 2 Timothy 1.7 gives us a characteristic. I, I summarize it simply by saying we shouldn't live with a spirit of fear. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's one of the earmarks, one of the tools that I have to reach a world, uh, to be an encouragement to brothers and sisters in Christ and to show people a little bit about who it is to be a Christian. When I have faith in God, and I, I was having a conversation with someone before church here tonight, and we were talking about how God works through even negative situations and, and difficult situations. You know what? I don't have to be scared even if we go into World War III. Am I going to be a little scared of some things? Well, probably. I am human. But there's a degree where I don't have to be scared of the end. I, I don't even have to be scared of all the, the steps along the way, even though I don't understand all of them. Why? Because I know as a matter of fact that God is in control. And so there's a difference. One of those tools that I have at my disposal, and you have at your disposal here tonight as a Christian, is that I don't have to live in fear of the things that are going on in this world. That doesn't mean they're always going to go according to my, my desire or what I want, but I don't have to be fearful of someone usurping my Heavenly Father because He's in control of it all. Isn't that a blessing? One of the things that I have at my disposal is the, is the tool of the Spirit or uh, letting that be something that's indicative of a Christian or faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I love this verse, Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a what? Anybody know? A city that is broken down and without walls. Doesn't that speak volumes? He that hath no rule or control over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down 
and without walls. We can look around in our world today and see p- people who lack self-control, can't we? That are, are motivated by fear and driven by fear or any other kinds of things. Uh, but again, one of the in, uh, in indications of a Christian is the control of his spirit. Finally, we have two more. And faith and in purity. Faith, a confidence in God. And this one, this is what I think I've shared with you before, that faith is one of those things that, uh, that I think about from time to time. Because it's an interesting thing. I, I look in uh, the Hebrew Hall of Faith. We'll be hitting that in a few weeks in Sunday school. And I look at people who are just motivated by God's word. In, a, in Abraham, as an example, when God said, just go, and Abraham went, or when they put their life on the line just because they knew it's what they were supposed to do. And I look at the people in Hebrews 11, and I think, am I like that? If God told me just to, how long would I give it before I just went? Or what would I ask of God before I was willing to do what I already knew that God wanted me to do? One of the things that I have at my disposal as a Christian that shows other people that Christians are different is the idea of faith. Abraham came to mind as one that was called to go to a place specifically. It's mentioned in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. And God told him, I want you to go. And the Bible says in verse 9, By faith he journeyed in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we have promises of God that we should live by, don't we? That should motivate us, that should drive us to something else other than what this world has to offer. And then finally, the the sixth tool that we have to influence or to uh, share the gospel with people, to encourage people in the ways of Christ, in the ways of the Bible, is mentioned finally there in verse 12. In purity. In purity. And you know, the other ones, th- those are good ones. I will look back over that in, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And this comes up time and time again as we consider who God is. And so I know I've mentioned that before. But the only way that I have fellowship with God is on grounds of His holiness. So what, another way of saying that is His purity. And one of the ways that I show that I'm a Christian and that I am an example of the believer is the way that I live my life in a sinless life. Again, not that I'm perfect, not that I don't mess up, and I think that's important for the world to understand that it's not that we don't mess up, but I'm intentionally trying and striving to live a life that is separated, not in a goody-two-shoe kind of a way, but in a my God is holy, and since I'm following God and He tells me to be holy as He is holy, I'm going to be different, not because I'm better, but because I want fellowship with God and I want to do something that honors and glorifies Him. That means from time to time the Christian's going to come up and when someone says, hey, let's go do this, we're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to watch that. No, I'm not going to participate in that. Not because I'm better than you, but because I serve God and I'm a Christian. Now, that's important even in our world today. I'm going to be different, not, again, not because I'm a goody two-shoe, but because I'm called to be different. Because God has told me that I need to be different. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22, I'm just going to read the first phrase of that. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. I've purified my soul. That primarily done through Jesus Christ, but on a continual basis as we set ourselves aside to be used by Him and to walk close with Him. So there are six tools in our arsenal as Christians that we can use to have an influence on Christians and on the world around us. It says in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You say, Pastor, that's great. How do I use that? Well, here's where it fits in our lives. I go to work in the garage. You know, if there's something wrong with my car or something I need to do, I I need a tool to fix it with. I I need to do something. Sometimes it's a hammer. Sometimes it's a nail gun. Sometimes it's a saw. uh, Sometimes it's a a gun. You know, any number of different things. I, I need the tool to accomplish the work. The tools that God gives us, at least some of them, to accomplish the work are done in verse 12. How do I reach a world? How do I encourage other people? It's in the things that I say. It's in the, the things that I do. It's in the way that I do them. It's the spirit in which I do them with. It's the fact I'm living by faith. It's the fact that I'm living a holy life. Those are six tools that God gives me to reach a world and to make a spiritual impact. He gives us that opportunity. Now, as Christians, we have every one of those tools in our toolbox. You know what? I have a lot of tools in my toolbox. Some of them I haven't used. 
sometimes people give me tools and I'll say, I say, you know what? I'm going to need that someday and I'm going to stick it in that box. Sometimes it just sits there. But you know what? Every one of these six tools that God gives us are essential to our testimony to other people that we influence. The question is, are you using them? They can sit in your toolbox. They can just sit there and you can do absolutely nothing with them. And praise God, salvation is still secure. Amen. But each one of these, if I pick it up and I learn how to use it, can be an impact for the Lord in this world. And so as we conclude tonight, I'd simply like to ask you the question, are you using this, these six tools to make an impact in the world for Jesus Christ? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to serve you. And we do thank you for the life that you give us. Father, sometimes it's hard to see how we can affect people, how we can make an impact for you. And so first of all, Father, I ask that you help us be able to understand who we can reach. But then I pray that you'd help us understand what you've given us to reach those people and that we'd be mindful of these six tools that you give us in Scripture. And Father, give us an opportunity to refine our abilities in using these tools so that we can make an impact for you. Burden us with the things that are important to you. Help us this week as we seek to serve you and pray that you show us how we should walk. And Father, I pray that you bless this invitation time. In your name we pray. Amen. If you take your hymnal, please, and turn to hymn number 481 as we stand. Our invitation hymn, Living for Jesus, hymn number 481 as we stand. to what I mentioned, uh, and if you're visiting with